towards man animal conflict that to wolf and young children conflict yes. happened in uh, <laughs> the early 90s i think yes. so uh, yeah his uh, contribution uh, somehow helped the, the country to devise certain mechanisms uh, to conserve uh, the uh, carnivores at the same time preventing man animal conflict there are there are many things we can talk about uh, the yala so it won't, uh, i don't want to take much of uh, the time so now i welcome on behalf of madurai kamala university on behalf of organizing committee on behalf of the participants uh, to this session sir now i welcome you sir so now i am handing over the session to you sir uh, thank you professor uh, chandrashekharan uh, for uh, introduction i don't know if i deserve all that you said but um, i will talk about the work that i have done and um, as i realized that uh, i already got a feedback from your student your phd student who told me about the background of your students so i'll try and talk about more about science and uh, uh, and how science can be applied for doing conservation okay so uh, you can stop me if you have uh, if you want to ask questions in the middle but if you can hold on to the questions till the end of the talk it will be much uh, uh, it will be better off actually so that's up to you and it's a uh, we got an hour and a half um uh, to talk so i will see how best we can um to get back to my yes, yes, yes. hello ha onial ji maine wo bheja hai i am in a i am in a seminar right now so i'll i'll not talk a thodi der mein baat karte I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen again. Okay, there it is. Now, now it's done. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, you should get this right. Visible? Yes, sir. Visible. Okay, fine. So I have changed the topic slightly uh, to covering uh, all large carnivores, not just uh, tigers. uh because uh, uh this is what i've been doing uh since i started with wolves way back uh, in the 80s so i am a sort of a living fossil right now if you consider for carnivore conservation in india and most importantly i would like to talk about how we can apply science uh to management and use the science to actually do conservation so that's something which uh, most wildlife biologists would like to see the end product of their work translate into management and policy and that's where i will thrust most of my talk about so as we all of us know that you know the, the world is facing a major crisis of extinction and the taxa of carnivores is the most affected because conserving large carnivores is something which is very difficult when large carnivores compete with human interests across the globe so they they compete for food they eat almost the same food that humans eat um, they kill our livestock for that they need huge spaces to survive and have viable populations and space comes at a huge premium with our human population bursting at the seams um, they also kill and eat humans as uh, professor chandrashekhar mentioned uh, there is a huge conflict of uh, carnivores killing our own species and 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 the stone age since the stone age what we have been doing is uh, we have been waging a war against large carnivores so we want to make sure that we make the planet more conducive for ourselves and remove all other biota uh, on this planet which is not conducive to live with us and large carnivores have suffered a lot but it was not so much of a problem till the advent of firearms uh, we could actually decimate their populations and sometimes result in extinction create do i mean making a pushing a species to the verge of extinction is not easy uh, you have to really strive hard to you know really uh, make a species extinct so firearms traps snares often do not work in exterminating a species you can harvest animals and animals will bounce back with their reproductive capacity but when you start using poisons then it becomes very very difficult for a species to survive so in the western uh, part of the world western hemisphere especially in the united states of america they waged a war against the wolves and the puma and mountain lion you know and and they tried to exterminate these large carnivores from the entire country but they didn't succeed so they started dropping poison from the air Known as Tan 
and what they would do is they lace the meat with poison and then drop it from the aircraft and this really exterminated most large carnivores across the entire subcontinent and wolves were only left in one state of um, uh, us and that was minnesota now of course in the 80s the whole revolutionary system started and carnivores across europe and in northern america have started to come back because with people's help and wolves have been reintroduced in the most parts of united states and they cover several states right now so this is what we have done and this is where we stand in india as well um, but in india we can say that without with the exception of one species which you see in the middle of this um, uh, uh, slide which i have shown the cheetah we have not lost our large carnivores all our large carnivores are intact and that is because of the people of india the culture of india the religions of india the eastern religions are very different from the western religions the western religions the abrahamic religions talk about human dominion over the planet earth everything that moves and lives on this planet is to be dominated by humans and used by humans and this contrasts very vastly with our culture and our religions where humans are looked upon as custodians of nature so this is the the actually the dichotomy in how our thinking has allowed biodiversity to coexist with high density human populations within india even despite having a large amount of conflict and even when you know large carnivore kill kills humans uh, we do retaliate but not to the extent the western world retaliates so this is the major cause it is not due to any policy at the government level or with the forest department or wildlife managers managing the parks so that our species survive of course all this helps but it is the attitude of the people which draws the bottom line so of course you all know this the though the yellowstone is considered to be the first national park in the world we had national parks in india created by king ashoka some somewhere around 250 bc and they were called abhayaranyas so the concept of creating protected areas and national parks existed in our culture way beyond where civilization had even not dawned in the western part of the world so why do we you know the the importance of conserving large carnivores you know the, the large carnivores are at the apex of the food chain they are at the top of the food pyramid so large carnivores can only exist at the top of the food pyramid if the rest of the ecosystem is doing well and by conserving large carnivores you ensure that the ecosystem in which they live is actually intact and functioning the way it should be functioning so this is the philosophy of project tiger okay so the project tiger is not a single species conservation program but it is a biodiversity conservation program by investing in conserving tigers we ensure that all the forested systems within our country are doing well because tigers will only survive if the rest of the biota is intact today the taj mahal which used to be and still is the symbol of india has been replaced to a great extent by the tiger talking about the tiger means you're talking about india so the face of the tiger is the same as the face of our country because we have the world's largest probably 60 to 70% of the world's tiger population resides in our country if you look at the global status of tigers which i'm showing you here uh, you see that currently as of today there are close to about 5000 tigers in the world and about 3000 tigers are in india okay this is despite india having very small protected areas yes. excuse me sir yes slide is not changing oh are you okay now can you see this slide no sir no sir okay, I'll, i'll stop sharing and start sharing again because here is showing me fine you know um now have you got a map of india showing up on your screen there yes sir yes, yes, sir. yeah okay just just tell me if it stops sharing because i'm putting it in slide show can you put it in a slide show yeah i'm doing that okay now is it visible yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. okay fine all right 
So what we have is the average protected area in the country is only about 239 square kilometers. We don't have large areas like the Serengeti, which is 30,000 square kilometers, or the Greater Yellowstone Conservation Area in US, which is 72,000 square kilometers. You need such large areas to actually conserve large carnivores. We don't have those. So we have very small protected areas. And we have about 1.3 billion people sharing these habitats with these large carnivores. And most of them are poor, economically poor. And India is striving to maintain a very high GDP. So we are trying to rapidly grow uh, in economic terms, which means sometimes at the cost of our natural resources. How do we put a balance so that we retain our natural heritage as much as our economic prosperity? And that's where the crux of conservation lies. So just we need to go back a little bit to understand uh, what has happened in the past and then how to deal with it in the years to come. So the, 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 you know, the ethos of conservation in India uh, was gone when the British took over. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the colonial era is when we faced most of the extinction crisis in our subcontinent. And huge amount of animals were massacred. Um, uh, bounties were given, uh, state bounties were given for killing tigers, dhol, wolves, whatever. State-sponsored um, eradication programs, uh, giving of arms, and all this happened. So this is the time when most of the bountiful wildlife of our country was decimated. Earlier, yes, shikar was the norm of our country, but shikar was only for a restricted few, which actually protected wildlife from the commoners. So only a few elite, the rulers or the kings of India used to do shikar. The one, the warrior tribes used to learn to how to fight wars by hunting animals and practicing their skills uh, of uh, using their weaponry by killing animals. Um, okay, just a second, I'll take this call. Hello, I'm in a seminar. All right, but the 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 beginning of modern uh, conservation era began in the early 70s uh, with uh, the initiative taken by Madam Gandhi at the uh, instigation of Dr. Salim Ali and this uh, Mr. J. C. Daniel from the Bombay Natural History Society, uh, who wrote a letter to Madam Gandhi um, in the early 70s, mentioning the plight of the tiger and saying that if we don't do something about the tiger, it's likely to become extinct in India. And Madam Gandhi took cognizance of this and with the assistance of the World Wildlife Fund, um, they gave about a million dollars. In those days, there was a lot of money. Uh, nine tiger reserves were set up as part of Project Tiger. Okay. In 1972, the Wildlife Protection Act was drafted by this gentleman here who's very much with us still, Dr. M.K. Ranjit Singh. And the first director of Project Tiger sitting in this Jeep here, uh, Dr. Kailash Shankala and his and his Sir. Yes. The slide is not showing. The slide is not showing. Okay. It's not changing. It's, it's not changed. Um, are you on this slide? Can you see this slide? Uh, which is a lot of animals dead. Dead animals. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Upside. How can that be? Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, I won't go into slideshow mode because that might be spoiling the whole thing. I'll just show you slides like this. this is good enough, right? Can you see this? Sir. Huh? So this is this is colonial India, which I just talked about. Okay, shikar and game hunting. And this is what I'm talking about is the modern era of conservation. Madam Gandhi, Dr. Salim Ali, Mr. J.C. Daniel, um, Dr. M.K. Ranjit Singh, who da drafted the Wildlife Protection Act. And this is Kailash Shankala sitting in the Jeep, driving the Jeep, the Duke of Edinburgh here. Um, and this is Mr. Pamar here, who was the first director of uh, the Wildlife History of India. He was also a director of Kana National Park at that point in time. So anyway, so that's the background of the modern conservation um, era in our country, beginning in the 1970s, much after independence. And in, in the 1980s and 1990s, we were very happy with Project Tiger. The Project Tiger expanded, and we were talking about tiger conservation happening. And papers were written by Mr. Pawar, who says, that, What do you do when you succeed? 
Okay, how do you manage success? So that is we were basking in the glory of Project Tiger, and at that point in time, China was getting rich. Okay, so what do you do when you get rich? Uh, you flaunt your wealth, and how do Chinese people flaunt their wealth? They eat wildlife. Okay, they eat wildlife. They use wildlife for traditional Chinese medicine. And you wear wildlife uh, and all kinds of wildlife products because that's that's how you show your wealth. And they decimated most of the wildlife in China at that point in time. Their attention changed to Southeast Asia. Uh, most tiger populations in Southeast Asia were depleted uh, to below extractable uh, poaching levels, and their attention then turned to India. So while we were very happy, and uh, uh, you know we thought that we had a lot of tigers. Um, uh, the tigers were being decimated by poaching in our country in the 80s and the 90s. So the official way of counting tigers was from their pug marks. Okay? So if there was a record of around 3,500 tigers in our country. When in 2006, we did the first scientific assessment with the uh, Project Tiger, and we found that there were only around 1,400 tigers left in India. And this rang a lot of alarm bells. Um, there were local extinctions of tigers due to poaching in Sariska in 2005 and in Panna in 2009. And uh, yeah, and because of that, the, the, the Prime Minister of India took cognizance of this and he created something known as the Tiger Task Force. And the Tiger Task Force was led by this lady, which you see in this Joining the Dots report, Dr. Sunita Narayan. Sunita Narayan, as you know, she heads uh, the CEA, the uh, Center for uh, Environmental Studies, um, and she comes up with uh, Down to Earth magazine. Uh, major activists of uh, looking at many issues in the country by environmental concern, but she did not have the wildlife background, and that was actually to our advantage. So we spent a lot of time sensitizing her on how tiger conservation is done in the country, and the outcome of that was this report, Joining the Dots. It's available freely on the net. You can download it and have a look. And it's a wonderful um, uh, documentation of how you can actually do conservation with the help of the local people and in states of poverty and actually result in an effective model for countries like India and probably Southeast Asia. So one of the mandates with the um, Joining the Dots, the Tiger Task Force report, uh, gave to the government was <clears throat> to scientifically monitor tiger populations uh, every four years across India. And this task was given to me and my team at the Wildlife Institute of India. And since 2006, we have been monitoring uh, the tiger population along with the co-predators like leopards and dhole and everything else um, and the prey. Uh, and every year, uh, every four years, we do this task along with the National Tiger Conservation Authority and the state forest departments. And as you can see, the policy changes and the management changes which the government has undertaken by creation of the National Tiger Conservation Authority, the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, uh, management of core and buffer zones of tigers, along with the corridors which intervene and join these uh, uh, core areas of tiger reserves. There has been a substantial improvement in the status of tigers. So the tiger population in our country has been growing steadily at an annual rate of about 6% per annum. So this is, today we have close to about 3,000 tigers. Okay, so this is the background of uh, uh, what, has, what has been going on. So how is this happening? What was the difference between what was happening in the 80s and 90s and what is the difference in tiger conservation in the country today? So there is a lot of technology which is being used today. Um, uh, for monitoring, we use artificial intelligence. Uh, we have camera traps being set up across the country. Uh, many of you, as you, you might be using these, these technologies for your PhD and your master's programs. So the camera traps result in wildlife images. They are heat sensors and motion detector, uh, and they take self-portraits. It's just like taking a selfie, uh, but the selfie is triggered by the animal's movement in front of the camera. So we had about three, th 3.5 crore pictures of wildlife in the last assessment. And it was humanly impossible to actually sort them into species. So we resorted to artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we have a program called CATRAT, which identifies the species and puts them in different folders. So that was one thing. We use drones today. We use uh, EI technology 
which uh, is uh, an anti-poaching uh, technology made made out of thermal cameras and uh, infrared cameras as well as uh, visual cameras which detect any kind of living activity in forests in day and night and report through artificial intelligence uh, humans or wildlife which it which observes and this can be remotely controlled by the managers through their mobile phones and you can actually see what the cameras are actually detecting uh, any time of the day at 24 7. so this has been a major deterrent and it has been deployed in about five tiger reserves today at especially along sensitive borders where poachers can ingress into tiger reserves uh, we use another technology known as m stripes uh, which is for patrolling as well as for uh, uh, ecological purposes it's freely available even you people can use it especially the ecological module which allows you to do distance sampling uh, for angulate estimation uh, habitat monitoring through vegetation plots uh, whatever else you wish to do uh, occupancy surveys uh, so on and so forth and for patrolling it you can actually monitor the live movement of forest guards across india uh, on a screen sitting in my office and seeing who which guard is patrolling which area at this point in time so this is live monitoring system uh, available to the national tiger conservation authority uh, all this has helped us um, reduce poaching dramatically so that the poaching levels today are below the recruitment level of tigers and therefore tigers are increasing so uh, you all can see my uh, slides right now right hello uh, professor saab yes sir. Sorry, sir. Okay. Okay. So I won't go into slide uh, show mechanism unless I have an animation, then I'll go there. But currently, there's no animation, so that should be fine. So um, uh, in India, uh, the Wildlife Institute of India, the National Tiger Conservation Authority, and this uh, the, and the Tiger States have mastered the art of capture and translocation of tigers. So wherever tigers have become locally extinct, uh, like Sariska and Panna, tigers were reintroduced uh, through artificial means, captured from other areas, and brought in there. We regularly use the technique of radio telemetry and satellite telemetry on tigers to study their uh, behavior, their hunting, their uh, habitat use, and so forth. I'm in a seminar. Who's calling? Huh. Seminar. Man. Call me later. Um, right. So satellite telemetry is the norm. We also um, uh, rescued orphan tigers, wild tigers. Uh, reared them in captivity and taught them how to hunt and release them back into the wild. And uh, we've had uh, second generation tigers born from these hand reared tigers. So they've been a very successful at rewilding uh, tigers through a specific technique of uh, training them to hunt. All right, so this is the way tigers are monitored. Um, this is the last assessment, uh, which won India, the Guinness Book of World Record. Um, uh, we had uh, the uh, in in the sense of the largest wildlife surveys in the world and this is a huge effort where about 45000 people collect information um, the camera traps were put up at 26800 locations we got 3.4 million images of uh, wildlife of which 76000 images were of tigers and from this 2461 unique tigers were identified Okay. So this is a, an effort which is of global uh, importance and then nowhere else in the world does such thorough uh, sampling and thorough coverage uh, for wildlife surveys being done anywhere. So how do you identify tigers from photographs? Okay. So we have a software, um, image uh, so, uh, processing software, which is known as Extract Compare, developed by a colleague of mine from UK, Lex Hebe. Uh, we did this uh, way back in the 90s. And what it does is it fits a three-dimensional model onto a photograph of a tiger. As you can see here, this green here is a three-dimensional model, which extracts the pattern of the coat, the stripes of the coat, which are then manually seeded uh, by um, uh, certain points in the, the ascending and descending parts of the, uh, the stripes. And it extracts a pattern. This pattern is stored in the computer. And you can compare thousands of images for the same pattern. And it gives you matches. So this is how uh, tiger um, identity is actually determined. And it is also used for crime fighting. For example, a skin which was seized in Nepal, in, uh, in Kathmandu, originated from a live tiger in, in Pinch. Okay? So we have this data set of around uh, 
4,000 individual tigers from India, Bangladesh, and Nepal, which we maintain in our repository, and the repository keeps growing as camera trap images keep coming in, more tigers are added. And this allows us to check where tigers were actually poached from whenever seizures happen and track the path of the illegal wildlife trade which happens. For example, there were five tigers which were poached from, poached from uh, Corbett Tiger Reserve and we could actually identify all of them uh, to have come from Corbett when they were seized in Haridwar. So you can know uh, and alert the authorities of what is happening in their parks and if poaching is occurring. So this has been also used by the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau to deal with it. Now, how do you monitor tigers? How do you actually estimate the densities? And this is something which is uh, important for all of you as students to learn. This is a technique which you'll be using uh, uh, for your uh, dissertations as well as for your thesis. So if you see here, uh, in this graph, what you see here is the encounter rates of pug marks okay, and tiger density. So in areas where you see more pug marks per kilometer of walk, the chances are that you will have higher number of tigers there. And this is the linear relationship between them. Tiger scat encounters, if you were to walk five kilometers in Periyar Tiger Reserve compared to five kilometers in Corbett Tiger Reserve, of course, you will see more tiger sign in Corbett Tiger Reserve. But this more sign means there is definitely more tigers. But how much more, we don't know till we actually calibrate it against known density figures and this is the calibration done for scat encounter rates okay. so um, the same relationship also lies with um, remotely sensed uh, um, variables like for example distance to nightlight which tells you how far away is a patch of forest from urbanization centers okay. what's the human disturbance factor in it and if you see here tiger density increases as human uh, disturbance declines. So distance from nightlight increases, tiger density increases. As tiger prey increases, again tiger density increases. Okay? So this, this is a um, the simple correlation which is then used in a multivariate model which allows you to create um, uh, equations, statistical equations for predicting tiger density and I'll come back to that in a little while. So Okay, so uh, large uh, uh, tigers rely on large ungulates as their major food source. Okay, so tiger distribution tracks that of large ungulates. Can you see the slide? I put it in slide show. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So every tiger requires about 150 medium sized, cheetal sized prey for its sustenance in a year. Okay, but to generate 150 medium sized animals, you need about 500 animals. So the ratio of one tiger is to 500 cheetal. And that's the standard which is required for a tiger. So if you have 50,000 cheetal, then you can have about 100 tigers. Okay? So that's the relationship, cheetal sized animals. It could be wild pig, it could be barasinga, gore, sambar, depending on the biomass. But I'm talking about, just to generalize, you need about 500 medium sized ungulates per tiger to actually have uh, sub substantial number of tigers okay, in an area. So what happens in our forests is wild ungulate populations are eaten up as bushmeat. Okay? So there is, um, okay, I'll come back to that a little while. So you can see here, there's a very nice relationship between the, uh, this is the prey density per kilometer square and this is the tiger density per 100 square kilometers. A very tiny relationship. Yep, can you see it? Oh, no, sir. I think if you put it in the slide, so it's not moving. And now it's now is okay. Okay, fine. So this re linear relationship uh, it tells you the carrying capacity of an area, and with a ninety-five percent confidence limit, you have prey base at the bottom, prey density at the bottom, and tiger density on the y-axis. Okay, and as prey increases, tiger density increases. So this information, all this information is used together in something known as specially explicit mark recapture. Okay. So how it works is you have tiger signs like pug marks. Is it visible now? Yes? Yes, no. no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So you have on the right side tiger sign covariates, that is number of encounter rates of tiger pug mark, tiger scat across the landscape. Okay. So this is a special data set. Then you have prey density in a special 
uh, data set. You have human disturbance, and then you put camera traps, but not in the entire landscape. You sample the landscape with camera traps. You, it's very economically impossible to put camera traps in the entire forested area. So the camera traps are only put in certain areas, while the other variables are measured everywhere. So when you join all this together, which is known as specially explicit mark recapture, uh, okay, what you get is a tiger density surface. And the relationship of this is that as tiger sign increases, tiger density increases. As human disturbance increases, tiger density declines. It's on the negative. While prey encounter rates increases, tiger density increases. So this relationship is built up based on the camera trap data and these covariates of tiger density. Right? And this is known as specially explicit mark recapture. It also accounts for animals which are not photographed. So it looks at detection probability as well simultaneously. So if you have got, um, if you put out 100 cameras in, in Periyar Tiger Reserve, for example, and in the first 10 days, you photograph 20 tigers. What it tells you that there are at least 20 tigers, but there can be more, right? If you were to uh, leave your cameras on for another 10 days, you might capture two more tigers. If you put them for another 10 days more, you might capture one additional tiger. So now you captured 23 tigers in place of 20 tigers with an effort of about 30 camera trap days. But there can still be more tigers. But the rate at which you start capturing new tigers declines because you're reaching a saturation point. So this model, camera trap based mark recapture, okay, allows you to estimate where that asymptote, where that plateau is reached, where all the tigers would be photo captured. You'll never achieve that, but statistically it estimates that plateau and tells you the number of tigers which are likely to be present in your park. So it accounts for that non-detected tigers in your camera traps, as well as allows for density extrapolation beyond your camera trap areas. And this is how we estimate tiger populations in India. Okay, so, okay. So this, this year around, okay, we had actually photo captured 83% of all the tigers. So we know that 83% of 3000 tigers actually exist. We have physical evidence of photographs from it. Just the, cam the, uh, the capture mark recapture estimate without the covariates is accounting for 87% of all the tigers in the country. And when you put the covariates, we have about 3000 tigers. Okay, 2,967 with a standard error range between 26 to 3,300 tigers, okay, which occupy about 88,000 or 89,000 square kilometers of the forest, which was sampled is about 3,500, uh, um, 350,000 square kilometers. So 3.5 lakh square kilometers of tiger habitat has been sampled. We have the world's two largest tiger populations in India. Uh, the one which close to your university, about 700 tigers uh, in this confluence between Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and um, um, Kerala, uh, Nagarhole, Bandipur, Vayanad, Madhumalai, Satyamangalam um, uh, uh, complex which is created here has about 700 tigers and Corbett Dudwa complex has close to about 600 tigers. So these are the two largest tiger populations in the world today. So we not only estimate tigers, but the same process is also repeated for leopards. And currently we have about 12,000 leopards in the country, uh, estimated as of 2018-19 cycle. Okay, I'll just, this is not it. So simultaneously, other carnivores and other mega herbivores are also estimated. So this is the elephant distribution in the Western Ghats landscape. This is the distribution of Dhol across India and you can get this information from the surveys which are conducted across uh, for along with tigers. Uh, we also get information on plants and this is for the first time that you have a map of all invasive plants across India, uh, across the tiger for bearing forests of India. Okay, And this has come out of the monitoring exercise done for tigers. So if you plan your monitoring exercise as well, you can actually um, a plan to use the resources in a very efficient manner, not only look at the target species, but look at all the ancillary information, which is very important as well. 
Okay, so this is how um, Sundarbans was a difficult situation because the Sundarban tigers are believed to be all man eaters, and and you can't walk around in the Sundarban because you'll sink knee deep in the slush there, in the mud there. Uh, the tigers are half the size of normal tigers, probably adapted to walk in the uh, sinking um, um, silt of the Sundarbans, and uh, we estimated. The Sundarban tiger population across Bangladesh and India with a joint collaborative effort through camera trapping and sign surveys. And the number was believed to be anywhere between 700 to 1,000 tigers. But in reality, we know that today there are close to about 180 uh, tigers present across India and Bangladesh. So this is um, a major breakthrough to estimate the Sundarban tiger population. Though, of course, it's much smaller than what we thought it was, yet it is a significant tiger population and is one of the top five in numbers across the world. So we also do uh, long-term studies on tigers um, with the basis of radio telemetry and long-term camera trapping studies. So besides Sundarbans, which we have studied for a long term, uh, we've conducted camera trapping in Corbett Tiger Reserve, radio telemetry and camera trapping for a long term in Kana Tiger Reserve, and radio telemetry and camera trapping in Ranthambo Tiger Reserve. So these four sites along with these three sites, along with Sundarbans, we have been studying long-term tiger demography. And the way this is done is that, I'll have to animate this. Just tell me if you stop seeing the slide, okay? So what we have is these are all different years, okay? So year one, year two, year three, year four. And within the year, you estimate your population, believing it to be a closed population. Closed means there are no births, no deaths, no immigration, no immigration. And that gives you a population estimate for that year. But between the years, okay, you consider it to be an open population in the sense that you can have births, you can have deaths, and you can have movement in and out of the population. So when you allow for this, it's known as a robust design. It's de developed by Pollock. And uh, if you look up the internet, you will get a monograph, a wildlife monograph on Pollock's robust design. Okay? You can read that up and see how the analysis is done. So what happens is for the primary periods, every year you get a population estimate and between the years you can estimate survival. Okay? So this allows us to look at survivorship of tigers. Besides that, we use uh, radio telemetry based estimates and individual identification of tigers intensively monitored through tourism areas as well as through researchers to look at uh, recruitment rate, interbirth intervals, um, uh, uh, survivorship, so on and so forth. So what we do, can you see this slide? It's an, um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, fine. Very good. All right. So we can identify tigers based on the, the tooth eruption, tooth wear, as well as the facial features and the body into these six age classes, cubs, juveniles, Sub adults, young adults, prime adults, and older. Okay. Slide is not changing. Now, yeah, now, 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 okay. Okay. So, so there are uh, six age groups into which tigers can be identified by looking at them. Because what happens when you approach a tiger? It usually opens its mouth and yawns. Okay. And when it yawns, you can actually see its teeth. And if you photograph these teeth, you can age it. Okay. So that's a non-aggressive way of showing you that, look, I've got such large canines, stay away from me, otherwise I'm going to kill you. So it's a way of uh, aggression, but non-directed aggression, very subtly showing its teeth. This is a growl here at the bottom, which is more aggressive. Okay. But yawning is a very natural thing which you approach. Any large carnivore, even langurs will do it. If you see a troop of langurs and you approach the langurs, the male langur will yawn, showing you his large canines in a non-aggressive manner. Okay. So this allows us to actually age the animals quite accurately. And once you have the age classes done, you can monitor individual tigers okay, across their life. So if you do a long-term study, this can be done not only for tigers, you can do it for cheetah, you can do it for elephants, you can do it for anything which is known as known fate models. You follow them uh, and they enter into your data set in a staggered manner so that all the animals do not enter at once. But as you collect information, so you might have 10 tigers in the first year. In the second year, you'll add five more tigers. In the third year, you might add 20 more tigers, so on and so forth. But you monitor them till 
whatever your study loss and count the number of animals which actually died during the course of your study. This allows you to have known fate model and you can estimate actual survival for your tigers. Okay? So this is a, 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 you can actually, if you're interested, you can look up these publications which we have to see how known fate models are used for looking at demographic models. Okay. So this allows us to estimate demographic parameters of animals. So we've done, I've done this kind of study with tigers, with rhinos, with black buck. Um, and for tigers, uh, this is the density in the three areas, sex ratio, age of first, um, uh, the pr proportion of breeding females in the population, litter sizes, cub survival, age of first reproduction, interbirth interval. Now this information is a long-term information. It sounds very simple, it's synthesized here, but it has taken us about 15 years to collect this information. So it's very vital uh, for understanding the demographic parameters of animals that you're studying. Because all this, all the conservation efforts which you do depend on these parameters. So this allows us to do population viability analysis. Okay, population viability analysis means that it's like a life insurance. So when you go to take insurance, and if I were to go to take insurance, the insurance agent will charge me a much higher premium than you because you are younger. The chances that you will die in the coming year are much less compared to the chances that I will die in the next year because I'm much older to you. So also they'll ask you whether you smoke, whether you drink, whether you are in the reproductive age, if you're a female, then your premiums will go up. The insurance companies want to make profit in case you survive or in case you die they charge you a premium accordingly. So they are at a win-win situation. What the population viability analysis models do is very similar to insurance policies. They look at the probability of a population becoming extinct. And this is model. And you can actually see this, that when you have 15 tigresses, breeding tigresses in a population, the chances of extinction are very high, about 15% chance that in the next 50 years, if your population has 15 breeding tigresses, the chances are 15% that it'll become extinct. But as soon as you cross the limit of 20 breeding units, the extinction probability goes down to only 5%. That's great because 5% normally most of us statisticians who are working with uh, populations are very happy with the 5% probability. It's their, you know, the alpha level of being 95% sure that the population will survive. And if you look at this graph here, what you see is the number of tigers being poached, all right? And poaching is there with us. As long as there's a market out there, some animals will definitely get poached. If you have a large population of 20 breeding units, okay, uh, in the core area of a tiger reserve, surrounded by a buffer, then it can take one to two tigers poached every year and still have a low extinction probability. But if you have a small population, and even if one tiger is poached every year, then the extinction probability goes to 30% very high probability and if you have two tigers being poached there's a 60 percent chance that the population will become extinct in the next 50 years right so this is a very important contribution from long-term research that you need to have a population of tigers which has at least 20 breeding units within the core area of a tiger reserve and based on this research of ours the wildlife protection act uh, has made it mandatory for tiger reserves to have a core of 700 to 800 square kilometers, which has a population of about 20 breeding units. Okay, so we, uh, based on our research, we advise the government of India to have core areas which are inviolate. That means they don't have people living inside them of at least 700 to 1,000 square kilometers. And the government of India has incentivized a scheme as uh, known as. Uh, incentivized voluntary relocation from the core areas of tiger reserves with 10 lakh rupees per adult in the family. Uh, initially, this, this scheme has now been revised and the new rates will be about 15 lakhs per adult in the family. But this is a major thing because when you give this, legally you cannot throw anybody out of the forest. Okay? It's impossible to do that legally. But if people want to move out, taking this incentive, there is no law which will stop them from doing so. So that's why it is called incentivized voluntary. You cannot evict people, but if they voluntarily want to move out, you can. it's allowed. So what happens is that core areas in which small hamlets like this are there, they are moved outside on the outskirts of the forest. Uh, they have a better housing. 
Um, they have agriculture, which is not raided by wild animals. Um, they have access to markets. They have access to hospitals, schools, electricity, roads. Inside the forest, they can't get any of this. And what you get in return is intact habitat for biodiversity. And this is, I believe, uh, the most important conservation initiative by the government of India. And we spend a lot of money. I put this in euros because uh, for international audience, they don't understand rupees. And you can just take it for granted that about 90 rupees to a euro. And you can see that uh, we spend anywhere between uh, 5, 000, 5 million euros to 22 million euros annually to move people outside of tiger reserves. And this, is, this has been a major uh, scheme by the government of India to create inviolate space within tiger, uh, tiger habitats, uh, to core tiger areas, to have 20 breeding units of tigers, which is a viable population of tigers. Okay, now the next slide I'll have to animate and I'll just take a while. Okay, so this is a scenario from central India. Just to orient you, uh, this is Kanha Tiger Reserve. Okay, this is Achanakmar Tiger Reserve. This is Bandhogarh here. This is Pench Tiger Reserve. This is Satpura Tiger Reserve. And the Narbada River flows over here, which is highly agricultural area. Okay, so if you look at the forest cover here, it looks excellent. You have the, um, the Tiger Reserve of uh, Kanha connected to Achanakmar on its uh, on its eastern side and connected to Pench on its western side through a wonderful forest corridor. Okay, so this is perfect. You have a meta population here because tigers can move across this forest corridor east and west and populate this entire landscape with tigers. However, as soon as you put infrastructure, roads, this is just highways. You see that our forests are highly fragmented. Despite this fragmentation. We see, um, uh, this, is, this is another view of the fragmentation. You can see my slides. You can see you're not able to see the slides. Yes, yes sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. no, sir. no, okay, okay. It's going to be tough. Okay. Now, okay, sir. Yeah, but it's, I need to animate this. Now, is it seen? Yes, yes Excuse sir. me, sir. Uh, okay. Sir, I, I can fix it. How? Uh, there is an issue with the select uh, the PowerPoint presentation slide. I mean, if you can uh, stop presenting and then uh -huh. click start presenting again and select the PowerPoint presentation slide instead of the PowerPoint, you, you may be able to see it. I didn't get you. Select what? Yeah. Uh, can you stop presenting now, sir? And then you can start presenting again. Select a window. Okay. Just a second. Yes, sir. Click on present now. Select a window and select the PowerPoint presentation instead of the PowerPoint. Once you start uh, presenting your PowerPoint, you will get two options. Yeah. I can demonstrate it for you, sir. One second. So. So that should be one more option with the same thing. Uh, is it visible now? Yeah. It's visible, sir. Yes. Yes, okay. Sir. So this is this is something known as circuitscape. Okay. So this is circuitscape. Uh, which actually models corridors and movement corridors. Uh, the lighter the color, the more the least the resistance for movement. Okay? The darker the color, the more the resistance. It's, it's a current flow from one potential to another potential, and it finds the path of least resistance. It is known as a circuitscape model, which uh, you people can use for your dissertation work to model corridors of any animal in a landscape. Okay? So it's, it's, it's based on uh, the flow of water or the flow of current, from the, it takes the least resistance pathway from one area to another. Okay. So what we did, we did tiger genetics. And if you look at the genetics here, each bar here, each color, multicolored bar represents a tiger. So there are about 57 tigers in this uh, uh, um, plot here. And the different colors represent different gene frequencies. Can you see the colors? Can you see this on the screen? You can see the Okay, very good. Okay, so if you look at the red color here, the red color is from Kana. Okay, this is K stands for Kana, A stands for Achanakmar, KPC stands for Ach Kana Pinch Corridor. But if you look at Pinch, P here has got red and green. So it has got its own genetic composition, but it shares the genetic composition of Kana. But if you look at Kana, it has also got some green. That means some tigers are coming in from Pench to Kana, but more tigers are going into Pench from Kana. 
Achanak Mark and Kana are indistinguishable. But if you look at Bandogad, which is B, you see that it has some genes from Kana coming in, but no genes going from Bandogad. Very few. If you see the yellow in Kana is very few. So Bandogad is quite isolated, while the rest of the tiger populations are well connected. So this genetics allows you to actually look at the composition of gene frequencies across your landscape. And you can actually find out which tigers are actually migrants, uh, moved from one area to the other, and so on and so forth. OK. OK, so I'll, I'll stop. Let's see if I can continue sharing. Can you see this? Slide has changed. Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Can't see the slide. Now you can see it, so yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Yes. So this is, these are the corridors, OK, superimposed on night lights, right? So if you were to look at this, you can see the night lights. And you see how they change? Can you see the change? No, no, sir. Not able to see the, uh, Can you see this animation? No. no sir. Okay, I'll have to just skip that. But it's showing that, uh, well, anyway. So, fine. Let's go back. Forget about it. We'll go to the next slide. So, we talk about tigers as being umbrella species. Yeah. But how good are an umbrella species are there? Visible? Slide is visible? Slide is visible. Yes. All right. So, if you look at this. <laughs> Okay, guys. Okay, so if you look at this graph on top here, you can see that the temporal activity which is plotted here, time against density, this is the density of activity. You can see that leopards and tigers almost have the same activity. The blue line represents the tiger's activity and the red line represents leopard's activity. The tiger and leopards also almost eat the same food, right? Except that you can see sometimes the cattle are much more in leopard diet. Animals like langur are higher in the leopard diet. Rodents don't, tigers don't eat rodents. But majority of the food like cheetah, sambar, wild pig, they are all the same between tiger and leopard. Okay, So they eat the same food. So they compete. Tigers kill leopards whenever they get an opportunity. So when you do, you know, when you say that the tigers act as an umbrella species for conservation, do they serve the umbrella role for all species? The question is not so for many, many, many species. And can you see this? I changed the slide. Can you see it? I've changed the slide. Can you see it? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Now? No, sir. Now is it visible? No. Okay. Yeah, now it is. Okay, so I've seen, I, I can't animate, so I'm just going to show you the slide as it stands without animation, okay? So if you see this, this is the density surface of tigers, okay? And this is the density surface of leopards. So the, you can see the leopard densities and tiger densities in Kana Tiger Reserve. So wherever there's high density of tigers, you won't see a high density of leopards. The leopard high density areas are different from that of tigers. So they are specially using different areas. So if you were to look at this, this is the rate of increase of tigers on the y axis, tiger density on the x axis, and leopard density as a color contours here. Okay. So you see high leopard density over here when there is low tigers, or high leopard density here where tiger populations are actually declining, right? Little difficult to interpret, but the crux of the story is that leopards and tigers do not mix well in a landscape. So they have to partition the resources in terms of either time or food or in space or in terms of micro habitats which they use. Okay. Okay, the same is the case if you were to look at Dhol, for example, right? So Dhol is another uh, large carnivore which shares its habitat with tigers and leopards. But unlike tiger and leopard, the Dhol activity peaks avoids the dominant activity peaks of tigers and leopards. So Dhol are diurnal compared to 
tigers and leopards. Okay? So they change their activity period to avoid confrontation with the two large cats. Okay? Because tigers also, tigers and leopards also kill the one. And if you were to look at this plot here, as tiger density increases, dhol density declines. So this is dhol density on the y-axis. Okay, so dhol is highest densities when tiger densities are low. But dhol and leopard can exist, coexist at high densities. Okay. So the leopard is not so much of a problem for dhol as the problem is with tigers. Okay, I'll have to skip this next slide because it's full of animation. Okay, and then come to the last bit of it, right? But where I talk about tigers. Okay, I think um, I, I, I will stop with tiger conservation because uh, I'm taking much longer than I thought. It's um, more for students, so I'm taking much longer to talk about it. I probably will talk uh, for about 10 minutes on lions and then not talk about other large carnivores like wolves and all that. Okay. So um, if you have political will, okay, which comes through people's opinion. So politicians like to do things when they know there's a vote bank. If the media picks up conservation issues, then politicians will support conservation issues. So tiger conservation is a big thing in our country. And uh, the, the latest report of mine, uh, the status of tigers in India 2018, was released by our prime honorable prime minister, Sri Narendra Bhai Modi. And earlier, uh, the joint uh, report on Sundarbans uh, transboundary uh, landscape between India and Bangladesh was released again by the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister is quite aware of uh, tiger conservation issues and supports them well. And I believe that's because of the media which supports tiger conservation. And that is because the people of India support tiger conservation. So if you have political will, then you can do a lot of conservation. And this is what the Prime Minister uh, has been saying. Conserving tigers is not a choice, but an imperative. And he says, that I call upon tiger range countries and others to come together to strengthen tiger conservation through sharing of benchmark practices. All right. However, uh, the same political agenda has been very, very difficult for lions. Okay. So the lions is a monopoly of Gujarat. But because of the political will, uh, they suffer in terms of conservation. Um, and, and that is, has been a difficult uh, uh, situation to bring in science in lion conservation in Gujarat. I'll talk a little bit about it. Okay. You can see these slides. Yes. Can you see these slides? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So this is the historical distribution of Asiatic lions okay, across the world once upon a time. Now, this has been reduced to this. Can you see this? Uh, this uh, is this India. Is India. Yes, sir. The map of India is visible, just the map of India? Yes, yes sir. Right? So this used to be the distribution of lions in India. Okay, most northern part of Narvada and up to Palamo in Bihar. All right. So this distribution of lions. And today, lions are only present in the landscape of Gir. Can you see this slide with all the ancient photographs on the left side? No. Yes, no. No, sir. There are photographs on the left. Okay, I'll just come here. This is this is visible now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, so this gear protected area is the last resort of the lions. And in the last 15 years, lions have dispersed from this small area of gear, which is about 1,800 square kilometers, to cover about 1,300 square kilometers of the Saurashtra landscape. Right. And these are the stalwarts over here who have done made this happen. Um, um, uh, mostly, this is the Nawab of Junagadh. Uh, this is Winter Blythe, the, um, the the principal of Rajkumar College. This is Dharma Kumar Singh, the prince of Bhavnagar, who did the first lion census in Gujarat. Okay, and Lord Curson, uh, who refused to shoot lions because there were only about thirty odd lions left when he went to shoot um, as a guest of the Nawab of Junagadh. Okay. So these guys were very responsible and today there are over 600 lions, um, that's what the Gujarat government says, uh, across uh, the landscape of Saurashtra. So unlike tigers, lions don't have stripes. So how did you identify lions, one lion from another? So what we use is the pattern of whisker spots on their, uh, just above their whiskers, which is known as the vibrisse pattern. So this, every lion is photographed 
on either side okay and you fill in a data sheet like this along with the teeth and notches on the ear which are considered uh, can you see this slide which is fingerprinting lines hello it's not properly sensitive fingerprinting line it's not properly sensitive now 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 okay sir okay. okay so we have a software which allows you to archive this information and search for individual lines in your database based on the whisker markings and markings of the years in the form of a clock dial okay so this is individual recognition of lines and the same population estimation which we do for tigers using mark recapture in specially explicit capture recapture framework you can do for lions and estimate lion density unfortunately for me um i've been studying lions for the past 25 years in gujarat uh, but the gujarat government has never allowed us to do a population estimation of the entire lion population we've done that for india four times over across the country of india but in my own state i am a gujarati i have not been able to do this because they don't want the true numbers to come out so the political numbers are actually portrayed for lion populations unlike the tiger populations which are estimated in a scientific manner so they do a total count and of course the analysis of the total count is done behind closed doors so nobody actually knows how many lions are present in gujarat they could be anywhere from 300 lions to 1000 lions today okay but we do have the science to allow a proper uh, scientific based assessment available to be done across the landscape okay so i have uh, radio collared about 35 lions uh, in the in the past several years and we have estimated their home ranges and we could I, we followed 110 lions um, which were non collared through the whisker based ids to estimate demographic parameters okay the same way we did for tigers and what we have is information regarding this okay so we have the actual um, demographic parameters of survival from cub stage okay you have 57% uh, survivorship here and the different causes of mortality m1 m2 it's an animated slide let's see if i can animate this i didn't realize i would not be able can you see this slide animated slide mm -hmm. and you no animation sir can you see can you this? see this overall survival to recruitment 30% yes yes sir huh? m2 12% other natural causes 12% human causes 5% 4% unknown causes 2% unknown causes yes visible right so this allows us to actually know the demographic parameters of lions right Can you see the annual survival rate now? I changed the slide. Can you see that at the bottom? Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there's okay. So adult male survival is about eighty-seven percent. Adult female survival is ninety-two percent per year. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. All right. So I'll I'll exit this slide and go to the next slide. Can you see this slide? It's a histogram, a bar chart. No. 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 Okay. Now. Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. All right. So you have lions here, and if you look at this, I've compared the demography of Asiatic lions with that of African lions, and you find that most of the parameters are similar. So this is population growth rate, average litter size, cub survival, adult survival, interbirth interval, sex ratio, cub to female ratio. Okay, so there is no statistical difference between the um, demographic parameters of Asiatic lions and gir compared to African lions. we believe that our lions are highly inbred because they have come through a bottleneck of only about 50 to 20 lions were left during the nawab's time and the whole population has built up from that 50 lions so they are highly inbred lions yet inbreeding depression has not caused demographic parameters to decline which is a major significant uh, important finding for us uh, because you would expect that if there was inbreeding depression then you would have most of these demographic parameters to be depressed in asiatic lions but now after this was done somewhere this paper which i published was published um, in 2012 and it has been almost 15 years since we collected this information 
and we see that now there is manifestation of a lot of genetic defects coming up in the lion population in Gir. Uh, animals are born blind, uh, cubs are born without limbs, and this is a manifestation of inbreeding depression. And of course, the lions are going through a major crisis of canine distemper virus, uh, um, uh, catastrophic mortality caused due to that. Okay. So we are having that issue. Okay, uh, so these slides I'll have to skip because they're all animated, but come back here. Um, so what you see in the home range analysis is that, excuse me, sir. you see the home ranges? Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, if you uh, put the slides in slideshow, all animations will come, sir. If it is in uh, uh, editing form, the animations uh, won't come, sir. It is in uh, total form. Uh, if you click the slideshow, all transition effects will come, sir. Just a second. So I should stop sharing. Just a second. Should I share in a window or in a tab? Uh, a tab, I guess. Uh, uh, the slideshow presentation it will come, sir. If you uh, click the person now, a window or tab. In that uh, slideshow presentation will come. You have to click that. It doesn't give me that. Okay, sir. Shall I uh, Naman said one, sir? Just a second. Um, as soon as I do the slideshow, it stops uh, allowing me to share. But we don't have much time, my dear. So we need to get on with this. It just shows me the different screens, so that's that's about it. So as soon as I go into slideshow here, your slide is visible, sir. Just your uh, slide is visible, but it's not in slideshow. Uh, no? As uh, soon as I go into slideshow, uh, slideshow, sir. Now this is visible, right? This is visible, no? Ah, yes, sir. Visible, visible, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to stop my presentation in another five minutes so that we can have a discussion after that. Yeah. So yes. just let me talk for five minutes and then we'll come back. It's not it's not much that you're missing with my animation. Doesn't matter. So if you look at the home range sizes here, this is individual lions. Yeah. And they range from about 50 square kilometers for breeding females inside the park to about 700 square kilometers outside the park. Okay. So the size of the protected area is actually too small to harbor a viable population of lions, right? Because they need much larger ranges than our national park or our protected area can actually offer. And that's why they are occupying this entire Saurashtra landscape. So the green areas are protected areas, okay? The dark dotted ones are cities. This is the city of Amreli, this is the city of Dhari, this is Saurakunda city. So these are night lights, which I have shown as dotted areas, but the lions are actually occupying this landscape in human uh, dominated landscapes. Can you see this slide animated again? Next slide. No, sir. It didn't change. Okay, so it's not changing, doesn't matter. Okay, now if you look at this, these are satellite locations of lions, visible, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this, this red dot which you see here, and you see the white dot here, this is a daytime location of a lion in a small hedge, okay, less than a hectare of a patch of hedgerow is present between the fields and the lion lies up about 150 meters from the closest hut. The, the farmers don't know that there is a lion sitting here waiting for the night to fall. It spends the entire day in habitats like this and during the night time it actually patrols and walks through the streets of villages. You can see this dot here on the left side. This is a lion walking through the streets of a village. Okay. Looking for dogs, looking for carcasses, looking for cattle, goats, whatever it can get its hands on. So these large carnivores 
are living in close proximity of people they've learned to respect people not try to avoid as much conflict as possible and hunt during the night stay in small patches during the day okay all right so this is the lion habitat suitability map across saurashtra right and these are the population numbers the darker the brown color the higher the suitability so this is the kimil protected area which has close to about 300 lions this is the sechrunji block which has close to about 60 lions and this is the eastern gir landscape which has close to about 30 lions and 30 lions in the landscape of girnar so this is what the population of lions are along the coast there are few lions but not very many uh, which survive here right so that's the current population which i can vouch for but the rest i am not sure all right let's just skip a few slides um uh, this area of gujarat where the lions live is an economic hub for development and we have most of the mortality of these lions caused due to human causes and you can see the photographs here a huge number of lions live in the proximity of uh, infrastructure which is coming up very rapidly and this is these are uh, near the docks uh, highways uh again on the uh, very important uh, harbor you can see lions breeding and they learn to adapt with this but this is what we are trying to portray here okay so this is what lions habitat looks like today and in the years to come it is going to be something like this because of the development which is happening and there's the gujarat government is not doing much to stop the development or to ensure that lion habitats are conserved in this area so it's going to be a recipe for conflict in the years to come and this is the food habits of lions what the lions do is within the protected area they feed mostly on wild ungulates okay this orange area is wild ungulates but in the areas which are human dominated they feed mostly on livestock okay so this is uh, the green area is uh, green and the red is livestock but the green area are scavenged livestock compared to the red area which is livestock which are killed so majority of the diet of the lions in the human dominated landscape are through scavenging dead livestock because there is a huge cattle population in gujarat and gujarat most people are vegetarian so the livestock which die naturally are just thrown and lions just feed on these dead carcasses of course there are conflicts like this when lions actually kill livestock but this killing is relatively only 20% of the diet compared to scavenging which is 51% of their diet okay, so we are somewhere So why is this possible? How can actually a large carnivore the size of a lion live with people in its neighborhood and not create so much of a problem? And that is because of the nature of these people, which share the habitat with the lions, uh, pastoralists to a great extent. But um, um, they tolerate lions to some extent as long as they don't kill the cattle. It's a very delicate balance between law enforcement and tolerance by the people. and the lions tolerance of people and not making kills uh, of livestock that often so this is this is a sort of a very delicate balance and it can be tipped in any direction um with even a small turbulence uh, which comes up within the gir forests the the maldharis who live there have learned to live with lions they have husbandry practices uh, which prevent lions from predating their prized buffaloes um and they make huge amount of profits by having access to free resources in the forest so a maldhari or a pastoralist who lives inside the gir forest makes 70% more profit compared to his equivalent who lives outside the forest so they are unlikely to move outside the forested areas of gujarat right so um the solution uh, to this is to make uh can you see this slide Yes, can yes. you see this graph with like and dislike group uh, and the values written here? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you look at this, the this is a this is a questionnaire which was taken of uh, a large number of people, and you can see that the group which liked lions in their vicinity in their neighborhood was large compared to the group which disliked lions having them in the vicinity, and the major cause. 
of liking lions in their vicinity was economic benefit which arises from lions. Okay, so people actually are making profit by having lions in the neighborhood. And what is this kind of profit that they're making? Is through tourism. Lot of revenue is generated legally and illegally through lion tourism. A lot of um, um, resorts um, and illegal lion shows are done. Let us see if you can see this. Okay, I'm going to make this. Can you see this uh, video clips? Yes, sir. sir. So these are all illegal lion shows. All right. So. So this is this is not allowed as per the Wildlife Protection Act. You can't do this, but people are doing it anyway. And there's very little what the government can do to stop it because it's done on private land. Um, so this gentleman here who's giving this uh, um, hen, uh, this poultry to this lioness was apprehended and he's probably put behind bars. But this, that's just because this video became viral and people could see it and they could nab this guy. But if it's done secretly, nobody can actually find out. So people are making a huge profit. Uh, they're charging a lot of money for tourists to come and see this kind of activity. But it is illegal. So what we propose is that we make it legal and we take it under the control of the government. Okay? So that you can allow people to earn revenues from land, living on their land. Uh, in a controlled and regulated manner by having village level consortiums. Okay, these village level consortiums will manage their agricultural land in a manner which is creates habitat for lions. Okay, so lions can come there, uh, they can have tourists visit them um, and take some form of liberty, not all the liberty which you saw in that video, which was ridiculous, but they can probably approach lions and see them on foot have experiences of the wilderness like campfires and all that which you cannot do within the protected area and this would allow the people to have a more economic state in lion conservation okay? um, and that would help the Gujarat government win over uh, people for lion conservation. Okay, so I'll just skip a lot of slides because we're running out of time and I'll just talk a little bit about uh, um, a slide here which you can see here on tiger conservation, yeah. So this is a countrywide assessment of the tiger genetics, all right? And what you see here is tigers from the Northeast, tigers from the Tarai, tigers from Central India, and tigers from Northern Western Ghats and Southern Western Ghats. And there are about 157 individual tigers which are analyzed here, just like the graph which I explained earlier. The color scheme tells you the number of alleles which are shared between these populations. Right. So what we see here is that Central Indian tigers okay, are the most diverse. They've got the maximum number of colors here. They represent all the tiger populations from across India in Central India. So if you were to look at this, this is Central India here okay, in this plot. And they share their alleles with Northern Western Ghats, Western Ghats, Tarai and the Northeast. The green colors from the, north, the Northeast, the, the violet color from the Tarai. Uh, the dark blue and the light blue from Western Ghats. So Central Indian tigers are the most diverse tigers in the world. But for conservation, we need to target gene pools which are likely to become extinct and are unique. All right. So we have this graph here which talks about genetic diversity on one axis, genetic divergence on another axis and population size on the y axis. So population size tells you how vulnerable a population is to extinction. Right? So these populations over here are the most important populations which are actually very diverse, have high diversity and are vulnerable to extinction. So those are the northeast population. That is the populations of uh, Arunachal Pradesh, uh, Assam, Mizoram, these populations of tigers are extremely vulnerable to extinction and are distinct and diverse. And those of southern western Ghats, that is Parambiculum, Araviculum, Periyar, and Kalakad Mundantarai tigers. So these tigers should be targeted for conservation. Right? So this is an important contribution of ours and uh, to the government of India that we are not only increasing tigers in numbers, 
but we need to actually look at the genetics of these tigers and target our conservation efforts for those tigers which are unique diverse and vulnerable to extinction so what we see here okay what we see here is an apex an inverted pyramid of conservation so if you look at the the cryopreservation is a form of conservation where species have become extinct but you can only preserve them in deep freezers and sometime in the hope that you can able to clone these animals from full genome information which may be available next comes ex situ conservation that means you can conserve animals in zoos in conservation breeding centers and so on and so forth then comes semi wild or relic populations like that what you have in small reserves you know the animals are there for namesake they are not performing the ecological role but are conserved and they can remain as relic populations for example the asiatic cheetah in iran there are only about 30 animals left there and that's a relic population um the uh, the siberian uh, leopards for example there are less than 30 individuals left that's a relic population for large carnivores what we have today in of in our country are many free ranging populations which actually perform their ecological role like tigers in most of our tiger reserves lions in good in gujarat there are sufficient numbers to actually perform their ecological role what we want them is to become uh, free ranging populations which also retain their evolutionary potential you can see this slide and the evolutionary potential can only be retained if the full array of the gene pool is also conserved okay so that's the idea of tiger conservation and for conservation of any large carnivore or for that matter any species so this line here is very important uh, the fate of large carnivores is not in the hands of scientists conservationists of managers but on how society views and values them what it is willing to pay and how it makes motivates the political will to conserve them so this is the crux of carnivore conservation okay so thank you very much i would like to uh, thank some of my funding agencies and people who have um, helped me do a lot of research uh, in the in the past 25 30 years and thank you all for listening and i'll take questions if uh, you have any for another 5 minutes thank you sir uh, any questions from the parties bond bond dey dey bond thank you sir namaste sir ha uh, namaskar please go ahead just identify yourself give your name and then ask the question yeah? yeah my name is sir shailesh desa and i am from gujarat sir okay shailesh how are you yeah, sir i am fine how are you uh, go ahead yeah, yeah. so uh, sir actually i want to study the indian grey wolf like landscape ecology so i am also planning like uh, from vidavadhan national park like bal region to the gr like from which lrk and also rampara wildlife sanctuary so i am facing like uh, one problem like the uh, it is a uh, habitat which i am selecting it is a very long very the uh, it is a very last last uh, long so i am like uh, like how to approach like which uh, some uh, different methodology and one more thing is like uh, right now uh, people who are doing the landscape ecology they are doing i think some uh, most of doing with the tagging or the genetics uh, like the, there is a movement corridor they and they are proving with the genetics or the collar by the tagging so i am doing with genetics and collar so it is feasible or not sir acha you planning to do with genetics as well as radio telemetry no 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 sir i am not doing with, like i am doing without it so oh. like it, so you are yeah. not going to do genetics also and you are not going to do telemetry either no, all right sir. so this is your phd yes sir all right uh, so you want to look at wolf population status across gujarat is what you are talking about right yes, gujarat sir. yeah so you are looking at the saurashtra landscape basically not yeah. the southern gujarat you going to look from velavadar all the way to lrk in between you will have your makaner area of rampara bay yeah? yes sir yeah. so i would suggest that you look at occupancy surveys yeah so occupancy will give you a good estimate of um, uh, so what you do is you divide your study area that entire landscape into grids and i would go with a grid of about um, 50 square kilometers okay or 25 square kilometers and you do sign surveys and questionnaire surveys in each of these grids for the presence or absence of wolves if you can locate den sites it will be very nice but i it's going to be difficult at the scale at which you are working yeah so occupancy surveys will help you do that and once you have this then you can contact me and help you with the analysis 
Sure, so you can you can talk to me later. Uh, I've shared my Gmail uh, email. You can write to me and then we can discuss over phone or something. I can help you design a study. Thank you. Sure. sure. Namaste, sir. Sir, this is Samsundar Vanna from West Bengal, Jungle Mall District. Sir, in my area, elephant and man conflict is very common. We are coming from Bihar and Jharkhand each and every year, two times each and every year. In the time of crop field, so are you suggest anything for the uh, to protect the things? Is it is the other area is larger or the or the less of nutrient or food resource that is why they are coming? It's difficult for me to suggest something without understanding the whole problem. I haven't studied in those areas, uh, but apparently, if I mean, it's an interspersed landscape with uh, forest refuges, uh, interspersed with agriculture. Elephants are definitely going to go for uh, good forage availability through agri in agricultural fields. So when you have a mosaic like that um, and, and large animals like elephants moving across the landscape, it is almost impossible to create, uh, uh, you know, the, stop the conflict. But the way to manage this conflict would be to use uh, barriers, you know, effective barriers like elephant electrified fences uh, over fields, uh, maybe seasonal fences when the crops are in and remove the fences when the crops are harvested. So the elephants won't learn uh, how to break those fences. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, the fences require a lot of maintenance. If the fences are well maintained, they can be very effective barriers. So the farmer should be involved in making the fences. The forest department alone, if the forest department were to subsidize these fences and the farmers were not involved, they don't bother to maintain the fences. So once they're erected. So I think it's a combination of uh, government subsidies for building those electrified fences and then maintaining them by the farmers. So if that's done, I think the problem can be resolved to a great extent. It can be managed. It cannot be removed as long as elephants are there and elephants will remain there. So this is done in the North Bengal, Duars and Kojbiya district are there. But in case of Minnapur, that things is doing very impossible. Pardon? What are they doing? This is only done in Kojbiya district, North Bengal. What do you suggest? So why don't you replicate it if it's successful? That is that is already done by forest department and the local people in the North Bengal district. But that is very impossible in the Jharkhand this district. Why, district. why is but it impossible? Because the, there are a lot of population are there. There are no large forests. So all forests are fragmented. So I'm not talking about fencing the forest. I'm talking about fencing the fields. But the but the field is first is very uh, this is very uh, costly now the people no, it's are not costly expensive. it's not costly it costs twenty thousand rupees to cover one kilometer the, the okay. area are mainly tribal populations so the, no, so the, the the government will fund it now the government will subsidize it yeah. okay you. so the government has to pay the tribals can't afford it. Last the tribals can't afford it, so you have to. Uh, it's a subsidized uh, electric fence, okay? And it's it's the cost is about twenty thousand rupees per kilometer for a three strand fence. But for elephant proof fencing, it might become a little more expensive. And the forest department can fund it. It has to be funded through the campa or something like that. Okay, sir. Last question, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, I'm Amit uh, Nagar from Karnataka, from uh, Uttar Karnataka district. So my question is that, like as you mentioned, Central Indian uh, tigers are more diverse. Uh, I mean, connectivity is one of the good thing uh, where we can uh, sustain the species for a long time. But uh, you said like lions have the inbreeding issues. So what kind of uh, like measures you suggest or uh, what should be done in the future? And uh, in the same. Uh, kind of habitat now with a lot of the political and other issues. Uh, now we are planning to introduce a, a, another carnivore which was uh, extinct during 1947. And uh, what's your uh, take on this? And the third question is like... Uh, Let's answer matter? one at a time. Yeah. Okay. 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 So the, the issues with inbreeding, you, you know, you didn't complete your uh, question about tigers. You said the Central Indian tigers are highly diverse, but then it didn't complete that question. So but what's lions, your question about the highly diverse tigers? Lions are facing inbreeding issue, huh? Ah, of course. So the question is on lions, not on tigers, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
tigers like we can sustain for long time because of the uh, good gene flow yes. but uh, uh, tigers uh, lions have the issues with the right. inbreeding you know, lions the see the issue is that the inbreeding in lions see, mostly what happens when animals are inbred the deleterious alleles which cause inbreeding depression are purged out of the population by natural selection okay so lions had to be inbred they are very inbred and that's what the genetic research shows but because of natural selection the bad or deleterious alleles over several generations are purged out so the effects of inbreeding on the population are negligible okay only when the situation changes like a new disease comes in or there is a catastrophic event the population does not have the large genetic base it requires to evolve and adapt okay that's the detrimental effect of inbreeding but now what has happened is the lions are maintained like as if it was a zoo the wild lions okay are all caught even if they have a small um uh, you know uh, if they got a small wound or they fall sick or something they are brought into captivity treated and put back into the wild so that allows inferior genetically inferior lions to survive and reproduce in the population okay so the purging what would happen with natural selection is no longer operational due to intensive management and health care of lions you cannot do intensive health care of wild populations you cannot have the activist approach which you do for cats and dogs kutta billi conservation cannot be done for wild animals and should not be done for wild animals okay so the wild animal should be left wild only then can natural process of selection appear so we have made lions what they are today inbreeding the expression of inbreeding depression is happening because of intensive health care we have to stop intensive health care of lions what that will allow is it will allow purging out of bad genes second thing is the supreme court has ordered that separate populations of lions should be done in 2013 within a period of 6 months and it's been 7 years nothing has happened uh we need to have population outside of gir right the prime minister of india has launched project lion a new project like the project tiger very close to project tiger but it is gujarat centric so even in gujarat okay if if you don't want to give lions out of gujarat in gujarat we are not willing to make more protected areas not willing to make gir inviolate not remove the maldaris from there we want to make lions into scavengers not allow lions to remain lions anymore there are areas in gujarat like in the um, the uh, the uh, ambaji forest division balaram wildlife sanctuary in northern part of uh, gujarat which are already protected areas can sustain lions with proper investment Baroda is a sanctuary which is north of Gujarat, which we have been talking about putting lions there for the last twenty years. Though it is in very close proximity to Gir and would not uh, work as a separate population, but we have not been able to introduce lions there as yet because it requires an investment of two hundred crores to remove the maldaris living inside Baroda and put them out. The Gujarat government has not done that as yet. Okay, so I'll I'll just take this call. And I'm in a seminar. Can you call me back after ten minutes? okay so um, uh, that's not happening within gujarat itself let alone let uh, lions being brought into kuno which is already prepared for lion reintroduction in madhya pradesh in the last 20 years the kuno wildlife uh, sanctuary has been made into a national park the national park is larger than that of gir the gir national park is 250 square kilometers while kuno national park is 750 square kilometers the density of cheetal in in kuno is 75 cheetal per, per square kilometer the density of cheetal in gir is about 40 cheetal per square kilometer so the density of ungulates is also higher in kuno but anyway uh, that aside so lions can be uh, you need to make separate populations of lions uh, away from gir so that in case there is a calamity like canine distemper which is operating right now we don't know how many lions have died because it is shoved under the carpet uh, you need to have transparency uh, in dealing with uh, uh, endangered species like lions which the gujarat government is not doing by the way i am a gujarati okay so i am from gujarat and i am criticizing my own government because it needs to be criticized um we don't even have a population estimate of lions based on science so these are all issues where which plagues lion conservation the lions have done extremely well in gujarat uh, they've you know they've done pretty well but that is not sufficient 
Okay, coming to your cheetah question, um, I'm the one who's actually uh, the principal investigator for the cheetah reintroduction project. And 10 years ago, uh, we assessed 10 sites within India for this reintroduction. What I believe is that today, India is economically well off to bring back what it has lost historically. Ideally speaking, we should bring in cheetah from Iran because that's the Asiatic cheetah. However, the, the Iranian cheetah numbers only about 35 individuals in the wild. Okay, so we had a discussion with the vice president of Iran asking them to give us cheetah. Okay, so he says that if, there, if we give cheetah to any country, India will be the first country to give it, but we are not in a position to give cheetah. And it is unlikely that they would ever be in a position to give cheetah to India because that population is declining. So even removal of 5, 10 individuals will cause catastrophic decline in the cheetah of Iran. You don't want to do that. But for a reintroduction project, you need anywhere between 35 to 50 individuals okay, to start a breed, a, a, a establish a population. And you need a regular supply of animals okay, which are behaviorally appropriate, okay, can kill prey, and you can actually manage them in the wild. And that supply of that number of animals is only possible from southern African cheetah population. So the IUCN guidelines are very clear. When alternatives of bringing in the same race or the same subspecies is non-existent, then you bring in the same species, okay, which may be a different subspecies or a different race. And that's what we are doing in the case of the cheetah. So we're looking at the behavior, the constant supply of animals which are needed to actually uh, form a population, a breeding population in the country. And that's why we're looking at Southern African cheetah population. And why cheetah? Why do we need to bring in cheetah? Uh, the tigers are an excellent flagship for forested ecosystems in the country. But the dry forests, the deciduous open forests and the grasslands of India do not have a flagship like the cheetah. The government is not going to give us money to conserve bustards or to conserve wolves as much as it would put in to bring in a charismatic species like the cheetah. Okay? So if you bring in the cheetah, you restore all these habitats. We're looking at three areas now. Puno Wildlife Sanctuary, where the lions are to be, were to be brought in, or still can be brought in. Noradehi, which does not have tigers, they brought in a pair of tigers, reintroduced tigers, are just a pair there. And Gandhi Sagar. And Mukundra, Mesrore um, Gad Mukundra area, where these areas do not have tigers. But by bringing in the cheetah, we'll be in a lot of investments which will help restore these habitats and the prey Okay, so that's about the cheetah. And we end the seminar, or do you have any questions, sir? Sir, uh, uh, still uh, they are having the questions. I asked them to write through mail, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so I, I don't mind. I don't mind spending another five minutes uh, okay. if you have any important question. Any question? Okay, sir. Uh, subspecies is more studied in mammals, especially with respect to charismatic species. It's kind of discriminated uh, below the mammals especially in the lower vertebrates uh, why is that so like can you put a so you mean uh, to say why are charismatic species more studied than uh, other species no 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 subspecies i'm i'm telling about within the species diversity right so it's it's very well studied with respect to mammals and uh, higher uh, uh, i mean uh, carnivores or other ma ma uh, mammal species Comparatively less with the lower vertebrates. I would say that. I would say that in our country, the entomologists are doing a wonderful job at identifying and with molecular taxonomy, which is coming in. Amphibians and uh, reptiles are being classified left, right, and center. We are discovering new species, new races, new subspecies uh, with the new tools which have come up. But of course, the mammals are far more represented because uh, they attract more funding and they're more visible. So that's that's what it is. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much. You. Nice talking with all of you. Uh, yes, you can you can write to me over email, and I'll try and help you as much as I can. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, welcome, ma'am. This is Professor Chandrasekhar from Madurai Kamaraj University, ma'am. Hello, good, good afternoon. How are you? Yes, ma'am. Good, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, just now we completed uh, the previous uh, lecture, a bit uh, delayed, 
So we uh, excuse us for five minutes, ma'am. We will no, join. Take your time, please. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So now, uh, 11.45, take 10 minutes. <laughs>